So we're going to set up our development environment um, very similar to what we did last time. And I think the best guide, as I've said before, in the, in the network folder, how to number zero is your guide of what you're going to need to do when you come in. Today we'll do it together, which will be a practice of what we've done, what we did on Tuesday. But then starting next Tuesday, uh, you should be able to do these things on your own based on instruction zero, how to number zero. So opening that up briefly again, the big idea is we're going to launch Visual Studio. You're going to need to sign in. You're going to create a quick testing project. You're going to either uh, run it in the Chrome simulator or the real device. We'll do real devices in a little bit. So let's do this part. Go ahead and uh, launch Visual Studio, either from the desktop or the start menu. Last time we created the Microsoft account, so you should be able to um, sign in with that. You will be using it through the rest of the course because we'll be using Visual Studio in part two and part three. So um, you can use the same one from Tuesday. If you already had one, just keep using it, that's fine. Or you can create a new account if you just want to use it for this purpose. For example, I might already have a Hotmail account where I'm saving all of my you know, personal email. That's fine. You can use your existing Hotmail account as your login credential for Visual Studio. Or you can create a different account, you know, a developer's account in Hotmail or Outlook if you want. So mine's loading up here, and you'll get the option to sign in. The 30-day trial has expired. The trial is uh, for you to give it a test run, and then after that you have to sign in. You don't have to pay for anything. You don't have to buy anything, but you do have to sign in. Go ahead and sign in. And again, in, in my case, it'll be obvious in that as I, as I do this, it, it may look a little slow. Maybe you've already got yours done already. But the point is, this is why you need to do this when you come in every time. When I come in, I need to set up my station so that all of this is done. And then I'm ready to lecture. I'm not going to go through this in the middle of the lecture, setting it up every time we come in. After we do it twice, you'll be able to then or uh, do it on your own, either um, from memory or the handout. Handout number zero, how to number, how to number zero should get that, get you started on it. <coughs> Okay, so I signed in. I need a new project. So, File, New, Project. And last time I didn't really spend too much time in this screen, but I'll look at a couple more extra things here compared to last time. So, yeah, we're going to, we're going to create the blank project again. And there's a name that we didn't do anything last time, location or solution. It doesn't quite matter, but uh, because this is just to kind of wake Visual Studio up. And if you already did it, this is OK. But what I'm going to do here on name, just to follow the handout a little bit more, I'll call this test1. This is the name that's going to be uh, your project, your, your app. And the default, if you noticed last time, this project is going to save into your Documents folder. Now mine says C users instructor. Yours most likely says C users lab. And then inside of there you got documents and inside of that Visual Studio 2017 and inside of that projects. This is another testing project that you're not really going to need so it doesn't matter where it gets saved. You could save it to your desktop, to your flash drive if you click browse. I'm going to leave it where it is in the Documents folder. It will automatically have here checked on Create a Directory, create a new folder for this project. So this Test1 project is going to be created in a new folder called Test1, and it's going to be in my Projects folder, in the Visual folder, in the Documents folder, in the Instructor folder. And 
and um, we've also got another option here add to source control we won't be doing this much in this class does anyone know what source control is anyone would venture a guess or an opinion <coughs> Shared among a group of people? Could be shared amongst people, sure. Thank you. It differentiates the different versions of Yes, you both, uh, you both are on the right track there, exactly. Different versions of your code. Uh, it keeps track of what has changed in your code. Uh, it lets you go back or forward to uh, different versions of the code and you can then restore them. You can um, cancel your changes. It'll keep track of it. It controls your source, source AKA your code. So source control would be a way to keep track of your changes. And you could collaborate with other people. Other people could look at your code, make updates, and this keeps track of the changes. Now, as I said, we're not going to be using this in this class, really. But if you'd like to, you could use source control. It's linked to your um, your Outlook account. It's linked to your Microsoft account, uh, and um, it's free. And uh, it's something that you could think about doing, but we're not going to use it in the class. So for all of that, I'm just going to click OK. And one of the reasons you want to follow handout number zero again as soon as you get into the lab, as soon as you turn on your computer and, and get into it, the, one of the, th the reasons you want to do this is because it's, it's slow the first time. Visual Studio uses a lot of resources on the hard drive and the memory, etc. When you create these projects, they take up more resources. So just out of curiosity here, I'm going to go look at something in my uh, documents folder. You don't have to do this, but I'm going to show you here um, documents. In my documents, Visual Studio projects, just to show you, there's the test one project in my folder of, of documents. And when I look at it at this point in time, created you know, right from scratch, it's about one megabyte. It takes up about one megabyte of space. It'll get larger. As I said, by the end of part three, the project will probably be about 150 megabytes or so. So it starts off very small in the beginning. And as we add more plugins and as we add more code and more features, you know, it uses up more resources. So that's why, again, you should do your handout number zero when you get into the, the room as soon as you can. What else I have next step here? OK, the default is that the project is set up for debug on Android. So you don't have to change anything, really. But just to note here, we're debugging the project in Android simulating. Eventually, we're going to change that to release. We're going to change that so it's ready to go out to the app stores, but that's not until part three. Uh, and eventually here on device, today, we will look at a real device. But for the moment, I will just run this in the current default simulator, an LG G5. You can switch to something else if you'd like. But you want to run this. Anyone remember the keyboard shortcut to run the project? in the browser from Visual Studio. It starts with F and ends with 5. Yes, F5. Yes, F5 will run the project right away. And then I get this screen here. So the web browser loads up. Google Chrome loads up. Google Chrome is running in a more of a simulated fashion, not as a real project, not as a real website. Because if you notice the address, localhost port 4400 slash index. 
So it's it's kind of running uh, dynamically. You cannot actually go to that file where you think it is. Localhost, that's often for a server. Port 4400, an uncommon port. So Google Chrome loads up the index file. It acts like a device. And it's running there. And if you're curious, um, or if you notice, in, back in Visual Studio, we get a con JavaScript console with some feedback. Current window fails to load resource. Oh, we're getting an error so far. Well, as soon as I loaded the project, I've got an error. Not a big deal. It says it cannot find favicon.ico. That's the favicon for a website. But this is not a website anymore. It's going to be an app. So you can completely ignore that. If you ever see this failed to load fav icon, just completely ignore it. Doesn't matter to us. If you want to fix it, if you really want like absolutely no errors or feedback, then you would put a fav icon file in the uh, WW folder of the project. And I'll get back to that. We get some console output here. So when we write our JavaScript code and we get console output, we'll see it here. But we can also see it in the browser if you want. Can try this. You can hit F12 in the browser also, and you'll get the uh, the inspector and the console. And, and the the odd thing is that the Chrome console will often show slightly different things than the Visual Code, the Visual Studio console. So it'd be good to use both. No, no big deal about their differences here. They both say fav icon is missing. OK, I know that. Then this one says device has not fired after five seconds. In my case, it might not say that on yours. Because I'm running my recorder, my microphone, and all of that. My computer might be using up more resources than yours. So mine says, well, device ready hasn't happened yet in five seconds. And we've got these other things regarding channels. Um, Cordova simulate ready and so forth. So just other kinds of output. That would be good to note as we test the project. And remember, um, when we get this console output, it may kind of fill up a lot, and you know, I might have a lot of stuff here, and eventually uh, it's too much to look at. So we can clear the console in Chrome by hitting that little clear button and we've got one here in um, visual code or visual studio clear um, every time you load your project and check f12 in chrome the console refreshes itself very useful it does not refresh itself in visual studio so this stuff here about fail to load fav icon if I do fix that issue and run the project again and look on the console here in Visual Studio, it'll still say that. But that was from an old instance of the simulation. So it's kind of odd that it doesn't have like timestamps or something. Uh, but just be aware that this does not clean itself uh, upon subsequent runs, uh, upon subsequent builds. So you might want to remember to clear that before you run a new instance, a new simulation. You can make some changes to the project as the simulator is running, but you can't make other changes. It's going to depend, and we will see the differences as we go on. So if sometimes you're trying to make changes and it doesn't work, if you're trying to edit your code and such and it doesn't behave, it might be that because the simulation is running, it won't let you make the changes. So just be aware of that. So you can just stop the simulation. Let's go ahead and stop debugging at the moment. That takes us back to the editor here. So these first six steps are uh, what you would need to do every time you come in to the lab. Step seven will be if you're going to use a real device. We'll cover that one in a moment. 
but you will also need to set you will also need to do step 7 when you come into the lab if you're going to use your own device you're going to need to set up the USB driver which we'll cover in a moment if you're borrowing one of my devices if you're renting one during the class it should be ready to go last I tested this in January before the start of the semester it all worked so if you're borrowing one of our tablets it should work just by plugging it in we'll cover 7 in a moment uh, so, uh, let's say after today, uh, we're going to talk about setting up your device. So next time you come in on Tuesday, you're going to need to follow all of these steps. Um, six, then seven, then eight, and so forth. And then this particular project that we're kind of testing with, it doesn't matter what it is. You could then close it and then open your real project. Uh, I'm going to leave it open for the moment. So all of this first part here, you need to um, you need to do on your own step or handout zero. Any questions on handout zero or the process we did? Okay, if we look at the next handout, um, the important part of number one. Yes. That's a good point. Sometimes I see a little bug that sometimes people won't see device like mine. And usually you want to set up the device, as we'll talk about in a moment, plug it in, and then start Visual Studio. And then it'll see there's a device. So sometimes by starting Visual Studio first, and then plugging in the device, it doesn't see it. So I've found with people, um, it, it, it's often better plug in your device, set up your device, then start Visual Studio, and they should see the device. And if not, just restart Visual Studio, and it'll probably see it the second time. If it still doesn't work, call me over. So for the moment, uh, handout number one here. We don't have to do anything in this first part set up Visual Studio. This is for you to do it at home. Um, create your first mobile project. We just did that, so we can skip that. Um, this is the part to deploy a real device. This is what we're going to cover in a moment extensively. But just as a curiosity, how many of you tried to set up Visual Studio at home? Raise your hand. A lot of people. How many of you did it work perfectly? Raise your hand. How many of you did you have trouble setting it up? A few people. OK. Half and half. So. That's fine. That, that's ha that happens. And um, obviously, if you've got a, a laptop computer, you can try bringing it in. We'll have lab time. We'll try to figure it out to see if it works. People bring in their computers all the time. We, we work on them, and usually we can get it to work. Sometimes, depending on the age of your computer, uh, on its configuration, like the RAM and all of that, sometimes it just doesn't work. It's the, the computer's too old or too slow. Sorry. It just won't work because the software is is big, modern, powerful software that requires a lot of resources. Uh, if it doesn't work at home, it doesn't work. Use our labs uh, during lab time here and such. And people that have taken classes before that didn't have a computer at home, they were still able to do the class. They stayed to the last minute, uh, you know, 9.30, and they did their work here, and they succeeded. So even if you don't have a computer outside of class, using our computers should should be enough. So all of that stuff is done in this lab. What matters is right here, to deploy to a real device. So I'm going to go over it in general, and then we'll do it in specifics. The idea is that um, these devices are set up as a consumer device when you bought them. They're set up for regular people to use for regular tasks, making phone calls, downloading apps, playing games, etc. We want to use them as developer devices. So we need to connect the computer to your device so that it speaks in that sort of developer language. That often requires to get a special driver. So I've got, you're going to need to search online for your OEM USB driver. Um, I've got some, um, <clears throat> some links. These are the same ones from other times, but uh, you're going to need to search for your driver, and here's how I would do it. So go ahead and open your web browser. Even if you're going to borrow one of my devices, here's the process. 
So, you know, I would search for Motorola, Moto G2, whatever I have, OEM USB driver. I would search for the name of the device as accurately as possible, not just searching, you know, Samsung driver. But you want to be specific. You want to search for the OEM driver. That's the original equipment manufacturer driver. We're looking for the driver where, your comp where our computer will talk to your device in the most direct way. Um, not when you connect it, it will show you what you download. Nope. It uh, varies by different people, different devices. It's never as straightforward as I would like it to be. Um, so this is why I have the time on, a, on today where we might have to go person by person, and that's fine. But it's going to depend on the person. Question. I saw a hand over here? No? Okay. So in my example here, I'm searching and um, you know I get these different um, I get these different results. I don't know which one it's going to be. Now I know because I've done it, but you don't know which one it's going to be right away. Maybe maybe it's number one result or number two or something. I don't know. Uh, this is the problem um, that we run into, that everyone, if you come in with your own device, there's different uh, manufacturers and so forth. Well, the thing is that uh, the great thing about Android is that the uh, different companies can, can change it to suit their needs. But the bad thing about Android is that the different companies can change it to suit their needs. So one manufacturer is going to change some features or buttons or options uh, on their version of Android. For example, Amazon has the Fire tablet and the Fire phone and all of that, uh, or, or the Kindle. Well, those Amazon devices are a version of Android, which they've changed. So the result here, it's going to depend on you and your device and such. What I would say is you're browsing here, your number one priority should be to go to the website of the, um, of the company and be very careful and look at the address of what you're clicking before you click on it. Because you're going to get so many results that seem like they're the correct one, and I don't want to scare you, but probably most of them are full of viruses. You want to look at the one, you want to go to the one that you know is of that uh, company. This one looks correct. Motorola Global. No, it's actually at custhelp.com. Not at motorola.com. Even though it says Motorola Global English UK. No, it's over at custhelp.com, which I'm sure is some spam site that's going to trap you and spam you and give you viruses. Worst case scenario. So I wouldn't go there. This one, android.com, that one might be legitimate. Yes, the real android.com, Google, and such. XDA developers, nope. Team Android, nope. Maybe one of these will lead you to it, but again, I would be much safer and recommend you to go to the manufacturer's site, usbdrivers.org. Nope, fake. So you can either do this route of searching or you can go to the company website and maybe do search or go to get help or just browse or it, it depends on each company. So what we're going to do is uh, again, let me just go over the quick general idea, and then I'll give you the time to do this. The general idea, according to the handout, is you need to go find your driver. You need to then download it and install it on the computer. On our computer here, you're going to install the driver so that then it can talk to your device. Well, we also then need to activate a feature on your device. In your Android device, you're going to go to your settings, and you're going to activate a developer mode. On most consumer devices, you have this option that is hidden. 
and depending on the device, you get to your settings in different ways. So however it is on your device, and when we do help time, we'll figure it out on yours if you don't get it right away. But somewhere in your device is going to be the settings screen. And at the very bottom, oftentimes, hidden, there is an option of developer options. Well, it's hidden until you activate it. And the trick is that in your About Phone screen, there's usually uh, something that says Build Number. What's the version of your operating system? Well, you have to find it somewhere in your phone, and you're going to find Build Number. You're going to tap it seven times. It doesn't look like a button or anything, but you're going to tap it seven times, and it'll tell you three more clicks until you're a developer. And I tap, and I tap, so you're a developer. What that does is it activates on the previous screen, oftentimes, a brand new option, developer. In that developer screen, we're going to activate the options of USB debugging. And it might pop up to say, are you sure you want to do this? You're about to activate advanced features. This could cause people to hack you. you know, it's going to scare you from turning it on. We know what we're doing, so we'll be fine. And like I said, I would recommend, if you're going to do this with your own device, I've got my real device that is where I've got everything important on it and, and all of that. And I've got my, my testing device. This is one that I bought at Best Buy. It's one of those $49 prepaid ones. It's on Verizon. I don't have Verizon. I have AT&T. So this is not even activated. And it doesn't matter because I can get it into Wi-Fi. If I need to connect to the internet, I don't need a phone plan. I'm not going to buy a phone plan for this device. I just connect to our Wi-Fi. So I bought this $49 device from Motorola, and this is what I'm using as development. My main phone, I, sometimes I use it for development if I just want to test it on different size screens, but I have one separate just for the purpose of testing. And by turning on um, debugging, it doesn't void your warranty or anything like that. But it does tell you that potentially someone could install an app without your knowledge. Potentially you could go to a website that um, you know, does something without, without telling you. But the thing is that you can turn that on and off. You can turn on USB debugging while you're in class, and then turn it off when you're going to leave to put your phone back safe. Um, so, we're going to take a little time here, not exactly the first break, but I'm going to pause the lecture at this point. Um, if you have got your own device, try to set it up according to this, uh, and if it's not working, call me over, of course. If you don't have a device, I've got uh, devices to check out. Uh, we'll form an orderly line if you want one. Come on up here, first, uh, first come, first serve, right here. You need to trade your ID card, some sort of ID card, credit card, ID card, yeah. cash, no, just uh, ID card and such, and um, I'll give you a device.